My name is Markus Müller. I'm going to chair this event. And I would like to begin with a little introduction to, to our workshop. Now, for those of you who have already seen that yesterday, bear with me, so I'll be very brief. And we will actually have our first talk start already in 10 minutes. So, so why do we care about quantum physics in the first-person perspective? There are a couple of possible motivations to look at this relation. Uh, one of them comes from the violation of Bell inequalities. So as we know theoretically, and as we also know conclusively from experiments now, quantum physics violates what's called local realism. And here's one of a paper um, where one of these experiments have been done. Uh, for this paper here, the first author is Marisa Justina, and the last author is Anton Seilinger, who just received this year's Nobel Prize in physics. Um, they do an experiment that violates Bell inequalities. And what they write here is that they falsify local realism. And in the abstract, uh, they describe local realism as the worldview in which physical properties of objects exist independently of measurement and where physical influences cannot travel faster than the speed of light. And Bell's theorem states that this worldview is incompatible with the predictions of quantum mechanics as is expressed in uh, Bell's inequalities. So in a nutshell, what this says is that when you set up an experiment like this one, that quantum theory allows you to see correlations that you couldn't see in your everyday life. Yeah. So we have a situation here where you have a source in the middle, it transports two systems to Alice and Bob that have laboratories that are very far away from each other. Alice chooses an input X and obtains an outcome A. Bob chooses an input Y and obtains an outcome B. And the statistical properties of the ex experiment are described by a probability table. So what are the probabilities of the outcomes given the, the settings? Yeah. So you can play this game in everyday life and just put a pair of shoes into two boxes and distribute this to Alice and Bob. And they ask certain questions, something like, oh, is it the left or the right shoe? What's the color of the shoe? But what you find is that there you find probability tables. Um, you, you have less, so when you do it in a quantum theory, you find different kinds of probability tables, namely ones that violate Bell inequalities. That happens, for example, if you distribute entangled particles to Alice's and Bob's laboratory. And what this in the end means is that either one of the following two things must be the case. So essentially, it's either the case that the observed causal structure of the experiment doesn't really reflect the actual causal structure, or something like unobserved variables don't have values, or unperformed experiments do not have results. Now, first option would be, well, you go to your laboratory, you know, you make sure that you really put Alice and Bob very far away. It really looks as if they could choose the settings independently from each other, and that's whenever you test it statistically, that is what you find. But perhaps there's some hidden superluminal influence where information travels from Alice to Bob. That would be a possibility that explains the appearance of these correlations. Um, or perhaps the choices of settings are not as free as you would believe, as some super deterministic models would propose. In both cases, however, these additional influences must be miraculously hidden. There must be some fine tuning that prevents us from using them, and for example, to build a telephone that sends information faster than light. So this is a notion of fine-tuning that some people, including myself, but not all of our speakers, as we will see, find implausible. And then the other option means that unobserved variables don't have values. And this is now an instance of the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. Some, there's something about observation or measurement in quantum theory that makes it play a very special role. So we have some sort of relevance of the observation, or perhaps of observers of the first-person perspective in physics, in quantum physics. And now this may motivate us to ask whether we should instead consider, we should consider views of the physical world that are a bit less like naive materialism or physicalism, where you say you have just objects with, with properties that they always hold irrespective of whether we look at them, or perhaps we have then more some sort of structural or relational realism or some sort of idealism that would be better in describing the physical world. Yeah. So in this workshop, we will explore this idea. We will look at the notion of the first person in physics, the different roles that the first person or the observer may play. 
and discuss whether it really plays an important or fundamental role or not. And we will certainly not all agree on this, so um, there will be disagreement among the speakers, and I think this is fine because we are here to discuss and to learn from each other. Um, let me say also that here we really adhere to strict scientific standards, so we're really open-minded when we ask perhaps some aspects of materialism or physicalism may have to be amended, um, but we aim at being careful and we, yeah, let me say clearly that we reject esoteric nonsense right away. Uh, we aim at real theorems that we can prove and experiments that we can actually perform. So here's a little overview on our speakers. Um, today, Thursday, will be something like Wigner's Friends Day. Uh, Wigner's Friend is something that you can see in, in the picture here. So, for example, here on the screen, you have Charlie. Charlie is a physicist that does a quantum experiment. So Charlie measures a quantum system. And then when Charlie measures, the state of the physical system is supposed to collapse and to give him a classical outcome. But then we have the super observer Alice, who is outside of the laboratory and is describing the full laboratory as one big quantum system. For Alice, there is no state collapse, but it's a unitary evolution of the total system. And so there's a tension in, in two different descriptions of the same situation. And putting the situation into bigger scenarios will then lead to interesting insights and perhaps apparent paradoxes. Uh, Eric Cavalcanti will be the first one to talk about this today. Um, we will hear from Eric that we can use scenarios like this for experimental metaphysics uh, with first-person perspective. So you say, if you put an experiment out like this and you find a certain correlation, then, for example, one of the four following principles must be violated, one of them being local agency, the other one being physicalism, or ego absolutism or friendliness. So I'm looking forward to Eric's talk because we'll learn how we can use quantum physics and experiments to say something fundamental about the structure of our physical world. Um, we will also have Chaslav Bruckner talk today. Um, Chaslav will also talk about Wigner's friend and about a work that appeared a bit earlier than Eric's, which can be phrased as a kind of no-go theorem for observer independent facts. Yeah. Chaslav will ask, what does it feel like to be Wigner's friend in some sense? Uh, our last speaker today will be Nuria Nurgalieva, and Nuria is going to tell us how we can really model these experiments on a quantum computer or simulate them on a quantum or a classical computer. So we have, you know, Wigner and the friend in certain uh, experimental scenarios and apparent contradictions arising, and Nuria will present uh, some theoretical work and also software package that shows how we can simulate the situation and what we can learn from them. And our second day will be a bit more conservative, so we'll not put observers in superposition anymore. Instead, we'll just talk about quantum states and what they mean and what they have to do perhaps with subjectivity or intersubjectivity. Uh, our first speaker tomorrow will be Jacques Pienaar from the Cubism group of, uh, in Boston. And he will talk about cubism and the embodied agent. So cubism is an abbreviation for quantum Bayesianism or perhaps quantum betabilitarianism. And it's about the view that quantum states are really an agent's beliefs about future experiment experiences. So quantum state not really being the state of affairs, but what you believe about your system. Now what Chuck will tell us is, if that's the case, if you take that view of the quantum state, then how should you think of measurement devices and their calibration, for example? We will also have tomorrow Emily Adlam speak. Emily is a physicist and philosopher um, at the Rodman Institute of Philosophy. And she will ask whether science really needs intersubjectivity, um, the problem of confirmation in orthodox interpretations of quantum mechanics. So it turns out that if you take a few of the quantum state like cubism or other orthodox interpretations, where different observers may be, disagree and have different subjective views on how to assign states, for example, then the question arises how you come to agreement. In particular, how we come to agreement in the first place that quantum theory is a useful theory. So I'm also really looking forward to that talk. We will have Daniele Oriti tomorrow speak to us. Uh, Daniele is um, in quantum gravity, but also quantum foundations and, and philosophy of physics. And he will tell us about agency, physical laws, and quantum mechanics with an outlook on quantum gravity. So 
as far as I understand it, part of the talk will also be about the idea that perhaps physical laws are better understood as tools that agents or physicists use to navigate in the world rather than actual law-like facts about the world. Our final speaker tomorrow will then be Lorenzo Catani uh, from TU Berlin. And he will tell us why interference phenomena do not capture the essence of quantum theory. So um, this is a bit going back to what I said earlier. We want to be really careful. And in particular, not everything that looks mysterious on the outset, that looks like a quantum mystery, is in fact mysterious. So we should really back up our claims that there's something specifically quantum and non-classical going on, and that we should perhaps adapt parts of a world view with, with really theorems, no-go theorems, for example. And Lorenzo is telling us that interference is not at all mysterious. You can get the same phenomenon classically, and the main insight will be, as far as I understand, but we will hear from him, that we shouldn't really think of um, the two arms of interferometer as influencing each other, but by being about inference, so about agents' updates of beliefs, and then the situation will become much less mysterious. So then the circle closes, and we, we have a Bell's theorem as our main motivation, but we're also careful in not saying that everything about quantum theory is mysterious, and we will discuss what remains, um, what to make of it, and if there's anything we have to adapt about the way we see the observer and the way the observer is embedded in the physical world. All right. Now, for the last five minutes, um, let me also tell you why I personally am, am interested in this topic and how it came that I am chairing this session today. Um, so, so what is my own view on this? And I will say that um, many of you may disagree, and this is fine, and some of the speakers will as well. But what I believe is that one main insight from Bell's theorem and the measurement problem is that quantum theory does not, not answer questions of the type, what is the case in the world? So quantum theory does not tell us what is the configurations of the two particles that are sent to Alice and Bob. It has, it's basically silent about that. But it does tell us an answer to another question, namely what happens to me next or what will I see next? For example, if you're Bob in this thought experiment, and you decide to make a certain measurement to choose a certain input y, then quantum theory will tell you what to expect and with which probability about what you will see and which outcome you will read. So um, in some sense, quantum theory statements, and I'm in line with cubism and that, are not really statements directly about the world, but about what we will see or what will happen to us as observers. Now, a typical reaction to this would be to say, well, this is a problem. Ultimately, we want to know what's actually going on in the world. And so quantum theory is perhaps incomplete, and we need to add other stuff to answer this first question here. But my hypothesis is that this is indeed not the case. And it's really good news that quantum theory does it for us that way. Because I believe that the question that have to do with I and the observer and the first person are actually more fundamental and indeed also more general than questions we may want to ask about the world. So what I would want to claim is that um, actually we are methodologically forced um, to take this point of view by certain puzzles that arise in science and in future technology. Uh, so these developments force us to consider more and more exotic versions of the question of what will happen to me. And we've already heard about Wigner's friend as one example. I will just give you a few other examples that I think are, are interesting and could be considered in this context. So one of them sounds a bit like science fiction, but um, some versions of it go back to philosophers like Derek Parfit, for example, like Derek Parfit's teletransportation paradox. I think of a transporter in Star Trek, but actually it's think of Abby the guinea pig who is living on Earth, and every morning she's traveling to Mars uh, to work, and she's using a teletransporter to do so, who scans Abby, destroys her, and creates a perfect copy on Mars, and in the evening she travels back in the same way. But now suppose there's a malicious admirer of Abby, and he tempers with the device, so that instead of one Abby, we'll get two Abbeys, one copy that remains on Earth and one that, remains, that ends on Mars. Now suppose Abby even knows that, and before entering the teletransporter, she may ask, 
well, what does it mean? What will I see next? Will I remain on Earth or on Mars or something else? What kind of probability should I assign to the two options? Uh, you may ask, well, probably you should assign 50-50 probability, but then you can come up with versions that are more complicated. Just make not two, but n copies of Abby, and they are distributed in different moments in time and different places in the world. And then nobody really knows how to answer this question. Or the Boltzmann brain problem, something that has shown up in different versions in cosmology. The idea is that if you live in a universe that is very large, say combinatorially large, combinatorially large, then um, you will have statistical fluctuations, thermodynamic fluctuations, or quantum ones that actually sometimes um, produce very surprising things because the universe is so large. In particular, you may have Abby or sitting on Earth and some fluctuations that just randomly produce copies of Abby somewhere out in the world, but these copies disappear very quickly in the next moment and maybe make a very strange observation before disappearing. So you can ask, if you're Abby and you believe that you live in such a world that is really big, what should you believe? Uh, should you bet on disappearing in the next moment or not? And if not, why not? And the cosmologists are really discussing this because they want to use this reasoning to say indirectly something concrete about the physical world. They would like to use it, for example, to exclude some cosmological models. Again, I have a puzzle here where an observer tries to guess what happens to him next, but we have no reason, how to, no idea how to answer his questions. Other examples would be Wigner's friend that we already heard about, or what happens if you simulate agents on a computer. Um, now, my claim is that these are questions we should really try to answer, so we should not focus so much on the first question about what is the case in the world, but rather, like, the, like quantum theory tells us anyway, it makes sense to focus on questions of the type, what happens to me next, or what will I see next? Uh, and my claim is that what physics at the moment can tell us is actually not the question W anyway, but the answer to question W prime, which is what will I observe to be the case in the world next? So, and then I would claim that the question about what happens to me next is more fundamental and more general than asking what will I see in the world next, and we should try to answer it in all these general cases and try to come up with a unified approach to do so. Um, now maybe I'll say more of that tomorrow, but as you can see, this is a bit my motivation to take the first person seriously and really to explore and to ask whether that reasoning and that idea that I've put forward is, is really true, that quantum theory has a message to tell us that we should take the first person perspective somehow seriously and look more at questions of the type I. Okay, but for now, let me, let me stop here. Let me again welcome everybody now um, to this conference and we will soon have our first speaker. Mm -hmm.